For our hacking competition, I made an online game called Maze. Actually, I made two hackable games. The first one is Follow the White Rabbit and that will be part of the story too, but the big one was Maze. And in the next videos, I want to recap the journey of creating that because I want to document it for myself, but I think it also serves as a cool example how you can start learning something and then making something. But first, what is it? In this game, you are a bunny living on the screen patch in the middle of the maze. And your goal is it to uncover the mysteries and ascend to become a mysterious white rabbit. The twist, you cannot solve the challenge of this maze without hacking. There will be spoilers in this video, so if you want to try it out yourself, you find the game on maze.liveoverflow.com. Though, when I publish this video, there might be a lot of traffic and the game servers and the site might be down, then maybe come back another time. Or maybe at the time of you seeing this video, I have even published the server so you can set it up yourself. In this video, I want to tell you about the development process because I have never made a game and I had to learn everything. So I thought it would be interesting to share my approach. Hopefully it gives you a good idea how learning something new can look like. Chapter one, motivation. If you are a subscriber of this channel, you might have seen another intentionally vulnerable game that you have to hack called Pwn Adventure 3. I made a whole series about it, me trying to solve all the challenges. And to this day, it remains one of my most successful series. I love this game, especially because it was only made for one Capture the Flag hacking competition. I was always inspired by this and dreamed about making my own hackable game, but I have watched plenty of indie game development documentaries to know that making a game is a massive undertaking, especially alone. So I thought that's unrealistic. In 2019, I finally finished my master thesis. At this point in time, my whole daily routine just consisted of waking up, working my normal job or making videos and going to bed every day. And there was this growing urge to learn game development, but I didn't allow myself to learn it because my mind was telling me that it would be a waste of time and I should focus on stuff like making YouTube videos. I always try to tell people that learning something is never a waste of time. And my argument for other people would be with game development, you would still be doing coding. There's definitely transferable knowledge. So just go for it. But I was still stressing myself too much. But sometime around the mid of 2019, I stopped doing weekly scheduled videos. And then at the start of 2020, I deliberately blocked a few weeks from work to finally just have me time. I wanted to learn game development and I rewarded myself with this time. So I don't get a bad conscience just doing game dev stuff. And fast forward to today, I do think I learned a lot and that even though it was just meant for fun, I still think it has benefits to me as a professional in other IT areas. Chapter two, IT background. I think to get the most out of this video to understand my learning process, it's important to understand the experience I already had. I'm not starting game dev without any programming knowledge. When I started game dev in January, 2020, I was 28 years old. I have a bachelor's degree in applied computer science, and I also just finished my master's degree in regular computer science. But there I selected very IT security focused courses. I have never worked as an actual developer, but I have worked on countless of programming projects in all kinds of programming languages since I was a teenager. I never made a video fully going over my life, but I share a bit in the secret step-by-step -step guide to learn hacking. So I have absolutely no struggle with the concepts of object-oriented programming, interpreting compiler and runtime errors to find my mistakes, how to use Google search to find answers to most of my problems and other important concepts such as code that has to run every frame versus long running functions, threading and thread safe types and so forth. You understand my general computer science experience in other areas will still help me a lot to get into game development. This is going back to the point I made previously. Learning something is never a waste of time. It can still benefit you in other areas. And so my maybe 15 years of shitty programming while not really being a game dev still has a huge advantage. But I should also mention some of my game related experience. Probably one of my earliest introductions to some kind of programming was with RPG Maker, where you could click together some command blocks and basic functions. And in high school, I made a very shitty buggy 2D Monopoly game in C++ with SDL. So without really an engine, but it's also not complicated. You simply have to figure out how to draw an image on the screen 
and that's easy to code, to copy and paste. And then you just move those images around. I also had a computer graphics course in university, but that was mostly just the foundational math, vector math and matrices, quaternions. I was really bad in that course, but I still think, even though I don't remember the math, some general understanding about the effects of 3D matrix transforms like scaling, rotation, skewing, and also things like gimbal lock does help me to better understand what is going on in 3D games. Besides that, I also really enjoy various talks from GDC, the game development conference. Man, those talks are so much better than IT security talks. I don't understand why our conference talks have to be so boring. Anyway, those talks don't really go deep into technical stuff, but it still provides inspiration and context and talks about higher level problems that developers were facing and how they solved it. Chapter three, what engine? I want to make a game, but how? Will it be 2D or 3D? And then which engine to use? Unreal, Unity, Godot, oof, difficult. It was pretty clear to me that I wanted to do 3D game dev. That related more to Pwn Adventure, and I better understand 2D game development. Essentially just draw images on the screen. 3D is what is more interesting to me. All right, but what engine? I did watch plenty of YouTube videos discussing differences and read discussions on Reddit. I was also looking a little bit at the licensing agreements and costs because in the context of this YouTube channel, which earns money with ads, this could be a commercial use. And you know, maybe I would even make a small hacking game together with educational videos and sell it for $20. You never know. But in general, I was thinking of making a hackable game, which means I also had to consider if the engine is a good choice for that. Unreal Engine would make me code in C++ and Unity would be C Sharp and tooling around game hacking is insane. There are tools to simply decompile c -sharp, modify the code and run the game again. It's crazy. So C++ would be a bit more interesting in terms of hacking, but there are crazy tools for Unreal Engine based games too. In the end, I chose Unity, mainly because it seemed like that there are much more tutorials and educational resources online. Me wanting to learn it, I felt like with Unity, it would be the easiest and fastest. There was one last concern though, I also wanted to make sure making a hackable game does not violate the user agreement of Unity. The last thing I want is legal trouble. So I asked on Reddit regarding if there are license restrictions on games built with Unity and if I can have a permissive EULA for my own game to create a hacking game. An official Unity responded, there are no restrictions so long as you are not granting permissions to reverse engineer Unity's software, which is all I wanted. Perfect. Unity it is. Chapter four learning resources. At the end of 2019, I stumbled over the Unity Humble Bundle. Typically, I'm not a big fan of something like Humble Bundle, not because it's Humble Bundle, but because it's a bundle. It's like Steam sales. You spend money on stuff you think you want, but actually will never use. And there's this psychological concept of the limited time offer and the discounts, which is just something I try to avoid. So for me, most of the time, it's a waste of money. But here I made an exception. First of all, some of these Unity assets seemed useful. For all of these assets, there are alternatives, which might be much better, but I have zero experience. So why not get a random selection of tools and assets and play around with and see what they can do. That seemed fun to me and provides a bit of motivation to just spend time on Unity. The other thing I thought would be useful is the Unity Learn Premium, a one year subscription to official Unity tutorials which I imagined would be a great resource. There was also the ultimate guide to game development with Unity 2019 valued at $200, which might be interesting too. Quick rant, this is bullshit Udemy pricing. Udemy is full of those courses that are always $200, but actually they constantly go on sale or there are coupons that lower the price to like $10 to $20. What annoys me here is that it's similar to the psychological tricks with Humble Bundle itself. Udemy or the course authors using Udemy engage in shitty manipulative sales tactics, which I just despise. So this is a $20 course, not a $200 course. Keep that in mind when you look at Udemy courses. The pricing is bullshit. It's artificially inflated so you can do marketing with massive discounts. Regarding those learning resources that I wanted, I'm a bit embarrassed because I generally tell people you don't need to spend money on courses because there are amazing YouTubers who make great courses, most likely even better, for free on YouTube. And they earn much, much less from AdSense. Only problem is finding them, I admit that, but they are out there. 
There's this psychological effect when you pay for something, it feels more valuable than free content, even though it's not better. And you also don't like to admit that the money you spent wasn't worth it. Our brains are evil. Here I was a victim of this sales tactic myself. I thought spending money on those courses could maybe help me. Looking back now, I can say the courses were all right. Wouldn't say they were amazing. Me making educational videos, I have a particular style and idea how an educational video should look like but it was okay for what I paid for as part of the Humble Bundle. I'm not regretting that, but it pains me to know that I used much more YouTube resources from amazing channels like Games From Scratch, Game Dev Guide, Jason Weinman, and of course Brackies, and many more, and they have not received a share from that money. Think about this. The free YouTube content was a lot more useful and actually valuable to me and probably many more versus the paid courses but the money went to the paid courses. For capitalism, I guess. Chapter five, game assets. To make a game, you need assets, mostly 3D models and textures. But making models myself would require me to first learn a tool like Blender or Maya. It still seems like a useful skill. For example, I don't have a 3D printer, but maybe in the future, and it would be cool if I had experience with making 3D models. But I knew right from the start, I don't have the time for that now. That would take at least as much time as programming and learning Unity. And my models would look like shit. So I knew I would want to buy assets. Now, from watching YouTube videos about indie game development, I know that players who have no clue what goes into making a game and have never written code, heavily criticize games that use bought assets. When I realized that's a widespread opinion, I got really pissed. There are some scummy asset flip games, literally just copy tutorials and try to sell them as a game. Of course, that's dumb, but attacking people that actually wanted to make a game and bought assets because their experience is mostly programming, that sucks. But luckily that wasn't really a concern for me because I didn't intend to sell and market a game. I just wanted assets to make it look good. I really love the stylized assets, something like the World of Warcraft or My Time at Portia. I would love to have that style for a game. But then I found Cinti Studios who have massive collections of polygon style assets and I immediately fell in love and knew I wanted to use those. Actually, I discovered them because besides the Humble Bundle deal I mentioned earlier, shortly after that, there was a Unity Mega Bundle sale. That was directly from the asset store. One of them was the Synthi Studios Mega Bundle. So that was perfect for me. Since then, I have bought many more Synthi asset packs. I basically own almost all polygon assets now. Besides 3D models, I also bought a few other assets. For example, a character controller, a spline tool to easily make paths for objects to follow, something to combine and optimize meshes, but also the world building mega bundle. And because I imagined making an awesome big island like Pwn Adventure, I was very interested in one tool in particular that was Gaia. Overall, I spent over 1,300 euro, so over $1,400 on Unity Asset. It's an addiction. But all those asset creators are self-employed or small companies. So it's also kind of cool to have given the money to people that try to make cool stuff for Unity. And ultimately, it's money from YouTube ads and Patreon. So I wasn't too concerned about spending that money. I mentioned multiple times that YouTube is not my job. So for me, it was really just reinvesting some money I got from a side project back into the side project. I should make it clear that assets are not necessary for learning. You can find plenty of free ones, but I think they were helpful to make the game look nice in the end. Chapter six, first step getting started. The most difficult step in learning something new is just getting started. Especially if you are younger and you have never really experienced how the learning process looks and feels like. I have plenty of experience what it takes to learn something. I know what time and mental commitment it takes. Let's take for example my journey learning pen spinning as a teenager. If you see me doing this, uh, it's a good chance that you play with the idea to learn it too. Doesn't look too difficult, right? Fun party trick. I thought exactly that when I discovered the Japan first pen spinning collab on YouTube. And at that moment I told myself, I'm going to learn this and get good at it. Shortly afterwards, I was sitting in front of the TV and I started practicing and copy the basic tricks. After a week, you have some of the basic tricks down, but practicing different tricks and their nuances when combining them smoothly, that can easily take months. And that's something I learned. I want to make this very clear. There is no reality where you discover pen spinning in a video on a Friday and on Monday you impress your classmates. No chance. Learning this means committing hours and hours of time. 
I'm talking hundreds and thousands of hours and most likely engaging in the community and become part of it. While pen spinning worked out for me, other stuff I wanted to learn and try to get into, I of course failed. I gave up long before I would become any good. But I stuck with pen spinning for whatever reason and it showed me what it really takes to learn something. I think that's why I don't have a distorted fantasy of quickly learning something. And so the goal of learning the basics of game development is a daunting task because I knew it would mean I have to spend hundreds of hours on this. If I don't find the time for it, I will never learn it. And so it was important for me to build up initial motivation, this urge I was talking about at the beginning, me really wanting to learn it, to get the motor started, but also somewhat having a rough plan what to do next and allocating time for it. I've often heard from people around me who want to learn something that they make a study plan collect tutorials, buying Udemy courses, asking constantly questions about recommendations for resources and books. And they spend dozens of hours on just researching that. And I'm claiming if they had just started immediately with anything, even the first shittiest tutorial that shows up on the first result on YouTube, they would now be closer to their goal than after they made that plan. Because even if it's a shitty tutorial, you will still learn something. For example, different words, what you didn't know before related to whatever you learn. And then you can use that to search for new additional learning resources. Now, I don't want to dismiss that this planning approach doesn't work. I haven't done any studies on the effectiveness of this. Everybody is different. So I can only speak for myself that that would never work for me. I just need to force myself to do something and then the gears start turning and I'm trusting the motor to just keep finding stuff to keep going. So how did I get started with game development? I picked a random Unity tutorial where somebody just walked me through step by step from creating a project, adding some game objects, writing some code and running the game. You can find so many tutorials for that online. I don't think which one matters at all. Any of these tutorials will teach you the basics of how to use the Unity editor and then important terms such as game objects, scene, prefect, components added to game objects such as colliders. I have to tell you that these super basic tutorials are boring as hell. I want to make a game and not deal with the basic shit. And so you lose motivation very quickly. But this is a feeling I expected and prepared for. I knew it would be boring and I anticipated it will be slow. But I also knew I just had to push through that part and learn how to use the tool, at least the basics, so I can then make what I want. So use the initial motivation to force discipline in the early steps, push through that. And when you then know how to use the tool, it's much easier to enter a state of motivation that just keeps driving you forward automatically. Chapter 7.1, playing around with Gaia. Now that I know the basic terminology Unity uses and how the editor kind of works, I can start playing around. This is also something I say a lot when people ask how to learn hacking. I say simply play around with it. So let me give you a few examples how I played around with Unity. One of the tools I got through the world building mega bundle was Gaia. It's basically a tool to create really nice looking terrains very quickly. It has this concept of a stamp and then you just combine stamps. There exists plenty of Gaia tutorials on YouTube that I used. Here are some clips from my very early projects. Don't mind the pink color. I later played around with different render pipelines and that's a whole other issue. But you can somewhat see here that I selected a mountain stamp and I can stamp the terrain and, and now there's a big mountain. And I spent a lot of time making different islands, getting a feel how to use the tool. I also had the asset crest, the water, which is free for the normal render pipeline, but I got the paid version for the universal render pipeline in the mega bundle as well. So I also played around with the water. Gaia also comes with default textures, but I wanted to use the polygon Sinti style. So I also had to experiment and learn how to adapt Gaia to use the textures from Sinti, which you can see here. So stuff like this takes hours, but it's necessary practice. Chapter 7.2, playing around character controller. Another very important thing to play around with and get experience is making character controllers. A character controller is what people call the code that controls the player character. And that is obviously a super important key part of any game, controlling the character. But this is not trivial because every game has unique requirements how the player character is supposed to behave. 
and there are so many things you consider. Here I again watch tutorials on YouTube of how somebody creates a basic character controller. And here you can see mine. It's very easy to move an object with key presses, but how it behaves with moving the camera and then things like gravity, collision detection quickly gets very complex. For example, so you implement walking around and you have collision detection for walls. Now, what if you have a very tiny misaligned object or a small staircase? Will this block your character? You have to think about, and by think about, I mean write the code that handles these cases. How high can a step be and does it simply teleport the player up the step? Is it a slow transition? And what happens to the camera? Does it jump up like here in this very jerky movement? Do you implement some smoothing? Slopes are another challenge. Does your player slip down? You need to code that. And consider a bit more complex objects where maybe some surfaces are steeper than others but you would still want to be able to stand on it. Will the code you write cause the player to slip here or not? You can also have stuff that affects each other. If you naively implement a jump that can be used when ground is detected below a player, then having a steep slope that makes the player slip can still allow the player to simply jump up the slope by smashing the jump button. Or think about gravity. How do you detect if you have to fall down or not? Well, you can for example cast a ray straight down and check if it intersects with something. In that case, you are on the ground. If you then walk off an edge, the ray doesn't hit anything, so you fall down. But when you are on a bridge out of wood with holes in it, as soon as you reach a hole, the player will fall through because the single ray didn't hit anything. You can solve the problem in different ways. For example, you can make the decision to make every collider for the object to also span over the holes, or if you implement some kind of other logic to detect ground, for example, with a sphere cast or overlap sphere. The devil is really in the details. And so I have gained a huge appreciation for making a good character controller for a game. Another thing I played around with were the Unity example projects. One in particular was interesting because it featured a third person controller, the 3D game kit. And that controller felt pretty good, so I thought maybe I could be inspired by that. And by inspired, I mean steal the code. So I loaded up the example project and examined all the game objects that make up the player, including the camera, and tried to replicate it in my own project. And this later actually became the character controller for the first hackable game challenge I made, which I called Follow the White Rabbit. Chapter 7.3, playing around Cinemachine. Along this whole process, I kept watching Unity videos in the background from many different channels. This also helped me to just learn what exists. For example, I heard of Cinemachine. This is a tool that allows you to create very nice camera movements. And for example, the character controller in the 3D game kit uses Cinemachine's third person camera, which comes with features like collision detection for the camera. That's the next complexity. How do you handle camera collisions with the environment in a third person view? Do you zoom in? Do you move closer on a direct path? Do you keep the height? Do you do that for every little tree or is there some kind of tolerance when you move the camera? This is all stuff you just have to play around with and experience and discover these challenges. Chapter 7.4 Render Pipelines I briefly mentioned already that there are different render pipelines in Unity and it's a mess at least at the time when I started because they were just in the process from consolidating the lightweight render pipeline and the universal render pipeline and there's also the default render pipeline and the HD render pipeline. It's all very confusing. I heard that the URP or LWRP is the cool shit and also the Crest Water I bought was for URP. So I tried to create and change the render pipeline for my Unity projects. And this is when you start running into those pink issues because textures and shaders all have to be adapted to work with a particular render pipeline and one asset or tool you bought doesn't support it. And from Cinti support, I know that they don't want to spend time on adding support yet because it was still changing so much. And so I went through a lot of pain and ultimately decided to stick with the default render pipeline. It might not look as cool as the HD render pipeline and it might not have a few of the features and also possible performances of the universal render pipeline, but whatever. Staying with the default one was so much easier and I would also recommend that to you. Though maybe in the future when it doesn't change rapidly anymore, then maybe URP is really cool. Chapter 8. A first test. Here you can see a first early proof of concept version that I also shared on Instagram at the time. You can find here all the stuff I talked about. First of all, you can see the landscape, the island. That was made with Gaia and of course adapted to use the Cinti textures. 
I also adapted the 3D Game Kit character controller to use one of the Synthi characters. This also required me to learn how to work with animations in Unity and about this awesome site called Mixamo from Adobe where you can download free animations for humanoid models. For example, when falling, when the speed increases, the animation transforms into this diving position. And I also implemented fall damage. Another feature I wanted was swimming. And gosh, that is another deep rabbit hole to go down. Making a character float with the water and swim around is not straightforward. In this case, I had to understand Crest, the water engine I was using, how to get the water level at the current position. And so I was able to implement something that kind of works and I was satisfied, but it's not perfect. And then I wanted to exit the water and I realized how difficult that is to implement. Imagine waves on the shore. First you are deep in the water and you swim, but the wave goes down, suddenly you stand because water is too shallow and then the wave comes back and it picks you up. And so this can cause this constant back and forth switching between swimming and standing. That doesn't feel nice in a game. So anyway, implementing this stuff in a good way is so much work, so much you have to think about, but for me, I only needed good enough and I reached that. Over here, you can also see where I experimented with different slopes and having the character slip down. Overall, I was pretty satisfied with the character controller and it felt like I could actually now play around with making my hacking game. But this video is getting quite long already and we covered all the technical aspects of getting started with game development. So in the next video, I want to talk about the creativity and how my creative journey eventually led me from this proof of concept to my first hackable game called Follow the White Rabbit, which laid the foundation for the third video about making the MMO game Maze.